Testing one, two, there we go. That's much better. Thank you very much. So we've been looking at a Bible reading plan for this year. I've got, we're on week, finishing week nine. We're into week 10. This last week we were in the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount. Um, going deep in Jesus every day, a harmony of the Gospels, all four Gospels read in a single narrative. And then encouraging you beyond that to go wide in the Word, reading the whole Bible through in a chronological plan, which means we've been doing numbers this week. I'm a little behind on the Old Testament. I got to do some reading this afternoon, about two days behind, I think, on that. Just to give you encouragement, if you're a day or two behind, don't panic. Just keep at it. You know, it doesn't matter if you're the first one to the top of the mountain or the last one. It's just, it's keeping, keeping on, right? So, uh, um, and if you still want to get involved, I've still had a couple of people a week, uh, uh, texting or emailing me and saying, can you send me the links? And you can share the links with your friends as well. It's not secret. Um, this week, well, we've been talking the last few weeks about how to read the Bible better. I'm trying to give you some help that as we go through scripture, you can find it more meaningful because a lot of people, you know, say, I just, I don't get it. It doesn't make sense. Uh, I don't know what's going on. And there are all kinds of, of, uh, reasons why sometimes it's not the most helpful as we'd like it to be. We read along, we get bored, we fall asleep, we, uh, we don't understand the culture. I mean, we're talking a, a span of thousands of years of culture, half a world way around the world, thousands of years of linguistic difference. How much has the English language changed in the last 20 years? I mean, there are words you used to use in one way you don't dare use anymore. Totally shifted, and that happens. And so we're really, we're trying to go back in God's word across culture and language and time barriers. But remember, we've been looking at this. If you just read the word, there's power in God's word. He spoke and it was done. He said and it happened. And so I believe if even we don't understand what we're reading, if we simply put God's word in our heart, it will transform. Amen? And by the way, if you keep at it, you'll start getting it as well. So this week, I started journaling on the uh, Beatitudes. I only got through six of the Beatitudes all week. I, I read the rest of the stuff we were supposed to read, but I did all my journaling on the Beatitudes. And yesterday, I got down to number six. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Now, what's the purpose for our reading the scriptures? Is it to get our Bible doctrine all figured out? Is it to get the prophecies all deciphered? Are those things important? Yes. So when I say that, I'm not saying they're not important. But the main purpose of reading scripture is to reconnect with God through Jesus, right? Jesus looked at the Pharisees and he said, you search the scriptures because you think in the scriptures you're going to find eternal life. But all the scriptures do is testify about me. And you need to come to me to find life. So scripture is not an end in itself. It's a means to an end. And that end is knowing Jesus. And through knowing Jesus, we know the Father. Because Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So I've been telling you, put on your big picture glasses we call it here in our church the great controversy that story of how sin began why it was allowed how it's being handled and how it's going to be done done away with in the end that big story we went over a few weeks ago but make sure in those great controversy glasses you have your jesus lenses in because jesus says i and the father are one if you've seen me you've seen him so when you're reading through the broad, the wide part, the Old Testament, and I read some stuff this week that once again I said, God, I don't get it. That seems a little much. That penalty for the guy picking up sticks on the Sabbath seemed just a little over the edge. Don't ask me to go out and stone anybody. And yet Jesus says, that was me. 
And I believe if we'll put our minds through the enlightenment and request of the Holy Spirit, asking for the Spirit enlightenment, against those tough passages with our Jesus glasses on, I believe God will begin to either help us understand or help us settle that we won't understand. It's a different time, a different place, but he is still love to the core. God, not just Jesus, is our savior. And whenever God even destroys, somehow it fits in to the salvific mode. And sometimes I don't get it and I'm gonna have to wait till heaven to ask the questions, amen? But if I've seen Jesus, I've seen God. Now, our purpose of reading scripture is to see God. So what does it say? Blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. So maybe the reason I'm not seeing God as much as I would like to is because my heart's still rotten. Now, there's a dilemma here. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, but we all with unveiled face, in other words, take off your sunglasses, take off the veil, are beholding as in a mirror, Jesus is the reflected glory of God because we can't take it full on. Remember, Moses said, let me see your face, and God said, no, you can't, I'm too much. <laughs> in our fallen sinful condition, his light would put out our darkness and we would be gone. So he veils himself in the sanctuary behind the veil. And he told Moses, I'll put you in the cleft of the rock. I'll put my hand over you. I'll let you see my back. It's kind of an interesting way of dealing with that. And then God declared himself gracious and merciful and full of loving kindness and just. He won't let the carnage go on forever. He will let sin's consequences take it out. So Jesus is the mirror. We all with unveiled face beholding Jesus, beholding as in a mirror through Jesus, the glory of God. Who is Jesus? In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. He made all things and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father. So when we look at Jesus, we're looking at God as clearly as he has ever been or ever will be revealed short of glorification at the end. And when we are beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, we are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. Transformation doesn't happen overnight. It happens at the speed of the farm. It's like growing up, but he does the work just as by the spirit of the Lord. So here's, here's the dilemma that came into my mind. If I have to behold Jesus, which is God in a mirror, in order to be transformed, but I can't see God till I am transformed, do you get the problem? Blessed are the pure in heart, transformed in heart, they'll see God. Now, wait a minute. The only way I can get transformed is if I'm looking at God. Do you see the problem? That's the, I'm caught in a circle. Where do I start? Where do I get? How does it get? How does it work? And I was, as I was thinking on that, I realized that God wants to reveal to us as much of himself as we are capable of handling. No, let me say it differently. He, will, he wants to reveal himself fully, but he only dares reveal as much as we can handle. And maybe the light-dark metaphor helps. Light always annihilates darkness. Darkness never puts out light. <laughs> light always puts out darkness. And think of sin as darkness. Our hearts are, we're, we're sinful through and through. And as a result, God has to veil himself. He can only put out so much of that glory or, well, getting next to God is like trying to stand on the face of the sun. It's, you're not gonna last long. It's just not compatible. Uh, we opted out of that closeness with God at the tree and we've moved into darkness and his light will destroy that darkness. So it's kind of this catch-22, until he gets rid of the darkness, he can't reveal the light, but the only way he can get rid of the darkness is to reveal the light. 
And he tries to reveal it in such a way and in such an order of things that it doesn't destroy us in the process. So it seems to me that God, who can read our thoughts, has an interesting inside approach. I'm going to just put one more verse on the screen. If anyone wills to do his will, same word in the Greek, both wills. If anyone wants to do his want, if anyone desires to do his desire, he will know concerning the doctrine or the teaching, whether it's from God or whether I speak on my own authority. There is a key in that verse that tells us something. God never does stuff for us just to pique our curiosity. When they said, do a miracle, he didn't. When people asked for help, he helped. God knows, and we know, that you can free a group of people from Egypt with plagues, purely supernatural, take them through the Red Sea on dry land, lead them with a pillar of cloud by, night, by day and a pillar of fire by night, have God's presence radiating out of the sanctuary in the center of the camp. Have the people eating food that is miraculously laid on the ground every morning, manna for them to pick up. And have them turn around and say, why have you let us out into the wilderness to kill us? Miracles do not convince people who don't want to be convinced. Raising the dead, raising Lazarus only got the Pharisees and Sadducees to decide they had to kill Jesus fast because he was getting too good. And again, to me, the catch on the, on the Lazarus thing is they didn't believe the demons could raise the dead. They accused Jesus of healing by the power of demons, of casting out demons by the power of demons. But they didn't even believe that demons could raise the dead. Only God could raise the dead. So we had to be of God. And yet we got to get rid of him or he's going to wreck our system. So the point is, even miracles. We say, oh, if God would just do some more miracles out there, maybe more people would come to Jesus. No, they wouldn't. And the point in this verse, John 17, verse Sorry, that's 7 verse 17, not 17 verse 7. A little dyslexic there. John 7, 17. If anyone wants to do God's will. Do you get the, the catch there? If you don't really desire to be transformed into God's image, if you don't really desire to follow him, if you don't really desire to know and live out his will, he will not reveal to you. First of all, he knows he's wasting his time. Second of all, the more he reveals and the more you reject, the harder you get. So when you say, God, reveal yourself to me, he reads your heart, he reads your mind, he looks down inside and he says, I, can on I only dare to reveal this much because anything else, well, have you ever asked for something and discover you asked for more than you wanted? I think he looks down in our hearts and he says, based on where they're at in their willingness to let me into their lives, how much can I reveal? Because if I reveal more, I will overwhelm. So actually, when you ask God for something, he may not give it as a respect for your free will because he knows 
you don't know the full ramifications of what you've asked for and he knows you really don't want the full ramifications of what you've asked for and he gives you what you're really ready for on the inside. Does that make sense? And so the more we look to him and the little bit he reveals from glory to glory, he will purify our hearts and the more he purifies our hearts, the more he can reveal So fortunate is what the word blessed means, are the pure in heart. Now remember the context. Jesus is taking the entire Pharisaical, Pharisaical religion of the Jews at this time and turning it on his head. They said blessed are the rich because they're blessed of God. Obviously they're blessed because that's why they're rich. And Jesus says blessed are the poor. And then even, that's, that's Luke. And in Matthew, blessed are the poor in spirit, those who are needy and who recognize their need. They're the ones that are going to get the kingdom of heaven, not the rich and powerful who don't have a need. Blessed are the meek, the gentle. The gentle are going to inherit the earth. The Romans were in charge of the earth and they were anything but gentle. Jesus turns it upside down. Blessed are those who mourn. Really? Yeah, they'll be comforted. If you don't have now, that's okay because you're going to have forever. If you're mourning now, you're going to laugh forever. And eventually the gentle are going to get the place. Because God's going to get it for you and give it to you. And there's no bad guy that will take it away then. Our world is one battle where the underdog is trying to overcome and get their equality, but that equality always turns into a desire to dominate, and there's a new overdog and a new underdog, and then the fight begins again, and it's just one thing after another. Wars and rumors of wars. So Jesus is turning up everything upside down. What's he turning upside down in blessed are the pure in heart? The, the Pharisees were behaviorists. They believed the blessed are those who are pure in behavior. Blessed are those who live exactly by the word and fulfill every ritual and every tiny thing. And if we keep a perfect Sabbath, Messiah will come. And if we do it right, we'll make it to heaven. And Jesus turns it upside down and he said, and by the way, the word pure is the word clean in the Bible. Blessed are the clean, not in hand. Blessed are the clean in heart. They're the ones that will be able to see God for who he is. When you get a view of God, it will either transform you or overwhelm you. And God doesn't want to overwhelm, not in that way. Kind of an illustration of that is found in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. I don't have it on the screen. You'll actually have to get a Bible and look it up. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Jumping right in the middle of a sentence in verse 6. Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you. That is the concept of justice. The troublers get the trouble that they have dished out. It's not really punitive. It's simply cause and effect. But this is speaking of the second coming of Jesus. It's a righteous thing for God to repay with trouble those that trouble you and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed. Now remember, they are living in a time when getting baptized is to put a target on your chest, when, it, when professing Jesus is to basically write your own death sentence because you're probably going to get thrown to the lions or crucified or something in the arena because Christians are being martyred. 
I wonder how many people would line up for baptism if they knew it probably was a death sentence. Getting eternal life is a death sentence here on this earth. So now to these poor, troubled, beleaguered believers, he says it's the righteous thing for God to trouble the troublers and to give you who are troubled rest. It's like you throw the one in jail who threw the innocent into jail and you let the innocent out. When Jesus is revealed from heaven, we're really going to see God then, right? Face to face. When Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, that's simply his glory. His glory is like a flaming fire. Taking vengeance, I don't really like that word, but you've got to read it in the context of before. On those who do not know God and do not, and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, these will be punished with everlasting destruction. That means destruction that is final. From away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. When Jesus comes, he only does one thing. He shows up. That's all he does. But he shows up unveiled. In the sanctuary, he's veiled. Why? So somebody could come to the sanctuary without being vaporized. It's like, again, standing on the face of the sun. His glory is more than we can handle in our fallen condition. And salvation is a little bit like upping your, upgrading your circuitry. You know, if you take a, my, my dad, when I, was a, when I was a kid, my dad had a, got this really great thing, a 12 volt trouble light for the car. You know, the same little frame with the hook like we used to have, the old timer trouble lights, remember that? And the, the light bulb was looked like a normal light bulb and just screwed right into, it wasn't a special socket, but the end, of the, the end of the cord didn't have a plug on it for the wall. It had two little alligator clips for the battery. Pretty cool. That bulb looked identical to the bulb you put back then in the ceiling of your house. But that's 110 volts, 120 volts, right? So what is going to happen if I screw that 12-volt light bulb into a 120-volt circuit? It's going to burn really bright for a really short period of time. Flash. Right? And I guess I liken this thing to, because of our fallen condition, we're born 12 volts. And God is about 440 volts. If we get the juice direct, it's, we're, we, we, we shine really bright for a really short period of time. And that's it. But if we connect with Jesus and have him transform us from glory to glory, he upgrades the circuitry. We're born again to a higher voltage. Remember, Jesus said to Nicodemus, you have to be born again, but it's actually higher born. <laughs> so we're born again to a higher voltage. And if we're in Jesus, he has us ready so that when Jesus comes and turns on the juice, all 440 of him, notice what it says in verse... 10, why does he come? When he comes in that day to be what? Glorified in his saints. If you've had your circuitry upgraded, when he shows up, you are going to shine glorified. But if you haven't had your circuits upgraded and he shows up and lets out the glory, 
flesh. You get the point? You cannot be in the presence of Jesus, of God, and not be transformed. It's just whether your circuitry can handle the juice that will transform you. Have you let him upgrade you? Are you letting him day by day upgrade you so that you're ready? By the way, he says, don't worry about how fast it's going. Let me start it, I'll finish. Okay, we don't have to worry about that. But he says, it's going to be from glory to glory. It's going to be from face to face. But I will upgrade you and I will have you ready that when Jesus comes, you will shine forever instead of flash and be gone. And my point of that is that Jesus' presence, God's presence, I mean, will transform you. Just which direction? And that depends on what you do with Jesus. So he says, by beholding him, we're transformed. But by beholding him in Jesus, oh, we can handle that reflected glory. He will upgrade us from glory to glory and have us ready. And the fortunate are the pure in heart. As God purifies us in heart, we will be able to see God more and more fully. Does that make sense? And if you say, God, let me see your glory, he'll say, I'll be happy to let you see as much as I dare let you see right now. But if you stick with me and keep asking and keep sitting at my feet, I will upgrade that circuitry. I will purify you more and more. And you'll be able to see me more and more. Which all brings us around back to our Bible reading. As you sit down in the morning to spend time with Jesus, You might want to ask yourself, do I really want his transformation? Do I really want his will? Jesus, would you help me to want your wants? Would you transform me into desiring your desires? Because the more we tune in to letting him have our lives, the more we'll see God the better you'll understand what you're reading. Whether you understand or not, sit at the feet of Jesus and let him do his transforming work. And the more you let him transform, the more you'll come to understand, the more you'll come to see God and what he's all about. So as you're reading, think about the heart. Jesus, would you utilize this time with you and your word to purify my heart so that I can see you more and more through your word, through your Holy Spirit, day by day. Please do not get anxious about your progress. We'll never feel we've made enough progress. Just be thankful for whatever progress he brings and keep sitting at his feet. Does that make sense? Be anxious for change and rest where you are. <laughs> Can you do that? I want more, but thank you for what you've given. It isn't that I have to have more before I can be saved. No, thank you that I'm saved, which means I can get more. And it happens a day at a time as you open his word, ask for the Holy Spirit. But be asking Jesus Transform my heart so that I can actually begin to see you more and more clearly. Because by beholding you, I will be changed. And as I'm changed, I can behold you more. And give me all the juice you can today, please. And get me ready for even more tomorrow. Amen? Let's pray. Jesus, thank you that you have given us an absolutely accurate, comprehensive view of God that we can handle through the reflection of his glory in your life, Jesus. May we want more. May we desire more. May, may we be just earnest for more, and yet may we, may we be able to relax 
and trust you'll give us all we can handle. And as we sit at your feet day by day, you'll increase our capacity and you'll increase your revelation. And we can trust you to get the job done when it needs to be done. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.